Well, the coronavirus continues to break records here in the United States. We are on schedule to surpass 3 million cases. So these are not the kind of records that we want. 3 million cases today. A new, a new University of Washington model, which is often cited by the White House, says that about 208,000 people could die by November if the current pattern continues, but more than 45,000 of those lives could be saved if 95% of the people simply wear masks. So for more on this, we want to bring in the former director of the CDC, Dr. Um, Tom Frieden. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Frieden, you are also the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. It's an initiative that is designed to prevent pandemics. Well, your timing's spot on. Um, so let us talk about what the president brought up yesterday. What I am, as a parent, is uh, I'm very concerned about. The president said that he is pressuring states to reopen schools by the fall. In Florida, they already said they want the schools open by next month. Um, I'm a parent of a nine-year-old. I reluctantly sent her off to camp because here in Pennsylvania, the camps have opened. And so she's packing masks and disinfectants. And according to her, they are socially distancing. But I don't know how you do that in a classroom. What advice do you think? What, what regulations need to be put in place in order to coexist with this disease safely um, come September in a classroom? And marie that's a great question. And in fact, in a couple of hours at Resolve to Save Lives, along with a bipartisan group of former education secretaries for the United States and a leading uh, schools superintendent from Philadelphia, Dr. Haidt, will be briefing on exactly that question. But I'll give you a little bit of a, mm -hmm. an early peek. First off, we have to acknowledge that we don't have perfect information. It's not a perfect world. There are lots of things we wish we knew that we do not know uh, definitely. Second, uh, the most important thing to allow schools to open as safely as possible has nothing to do with what the school does. It has to do what, with what all of us do to make the community safer so that the amount of virus in the school decreases, the amount of virus in the community decreases. If you've got an exploding epidemic as you have in Phoenix today, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to open schools. But if you have it under control or under reasonably good control, then there are lots of good reasons to try to open schools, but you need to do that carefully. If you charge right into it, it's not going to work out well. Look at Arizona, Texas, Florida, rushing into reopening leads you to take one quick careless step forward and many steps backward. We have to protect mm -hmm. our students, the staff, the teachers, and there are a series of ways we can do that. They're not simple, they're not quick, but they're common sense. And there's good evidence that many of them will help reduce the risk. But we have to admit the virus is here. We haven't controlled it in the US. It has the upper hand. And in order to open our schools as safely as possible, we have to do it very carefully. Do your recommendations um, include social distancing? Because I don't know how you do that in a classroom. There are lots of things that schools can do. You can take steps first to keep the most vulnerable out. So kids who've got leukemia, mm -hmm older staff, staff who have underlying conditions, they're gonna to have to keep distancing. Second, you're gonna to have to prioritize. Maybe the high schoolers can do a lot more teleschool and only some in person. And then when you enter the school building, every single person should sanitize their hands and wear a mask. That's really important, very, very important. And you have to think not just about the kids in schools, but you also have to think about the staff and teachers. If you make the analogy to healthcare settings, a lot of the spread in healthcare settings was in break rooms where one healthcare worker mm -hmm. infected another. So you're gonna to have to close the break rooms in schools. They're not going to be able to socialize among the adults there. We know that kids are much less likely to get severely ill with COVID, despite the very serious Kawasaki-like syndrome of an inflammatory condition. It's rare, but it is serious. But kids do get infected. They do get seriously ill, and they may be able to spread it to others. They have a lot of virus in their mouths and nose when they have the infection. So it's not as if kids are in any way immune from this, but we have to balance risks and benefits. And the risks, the harms, of closing schools are enormous, not just educational, but social, health, 
economic. So all of us want our kids to get back to learning. And what we've seen is that mm -hmm. with schools not in place, with teleschool more, not only is education falling, but it's particularly falling for the kids who need it most. We're failing them. That's why we all have to get together to control COVID, the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. And governments need to do a really good job testing quickly, isolating patients, contact tracing, and supporting people on quarantine so that the chains of transmission mm -hmm. can be broken. We can do this. Right now, the virus has an upper hand, but if we take strong action, we can recover our schools, our health, and our economy. But right now, it's not happening. I like that, the three W's so you can get back to the three R's. That's, that's the slogan I'm gonna put forward there. You can have that. Um, so let us talk about, uh, you know, the other thing that's sort of confounding about this virus is it feels like every week we're hearing about new studies, new information. And now there is an increased concern about the airborne virus, right? Um, we have been talking about droplets and how the virus survives in droplets. So if people talk or sing or sneeze or cough, there's a risk there. But increasingly, doctors are concerned about airborne viruses. And 200 scientists have signed an open letter asking the World Health Organization and the CDC to change their guidance to incorporate air, the risk of airborne virus. Resolve to save lives. Has your organization also thought about that when you kind of have put together your list of recommendations? And Marie, we've, we've thought about this. We've looked at the data. There isn't enough data. And one reality is that the way science works is we learn. And as we learn, we do everything we can to protect people. The issue of aerosol or airborne transmission is a controversial one. If we look at other infectious diseases, for example, measles and tuberculosis, those are both very clearly droplet airborne diseases that can stay in the air for hours. So you have measles outbreaks where one kid goes into an emergency department, leaves, and two or three hours later, people are still getting infected because that kid was coughing. We haven't seen that kind of outbreak as far as we know with COVID. On the other hand, there are certain things that clearly can create aerosols. Singing is a really good example. And with um, uh, measles and tuberculosis, we have examples of really big outbreaks in choirs. And guess what? We're also seeing outbreaks in choirs um, in uh, COVID. So I think there's no doubt that aerosol transmission may occur. The real question is, what does it mean? Why is that important? And how common is it? I think the first thing you have to say is, wear a mask. Because whether it's small droplets or big droplets, if you wear a mask, you drastically reduce the risk that you will spread it to others. And if all of us wear a mask, all of us are safer. It's a responsible thing to do. It's what we can do together to keep our communities safe. If aerosolized transmission is important, then increasing ventilation and using either HEPA or UV filters may have some role. That's complicated and important um, and expensive, but you also have to be really careful because if you increase ventilation by blowing a fan, that actually may spread droplets to more people. And that's what happened in a restaurant in China where you could see where the air conditioning blew, the people who were downwind of that within six feet generally had a much higher risk of infection. But interestingly, in that outbreak, none of the wait staff who were not wearing masks got infected. So I, I think there's more science to be told here, but bottom line, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and avoid crowded indoor spaces that aren't well ventilated with lots of people together, because that's where you can have a lot of spread. I want to ask you really quickly about the numbers, because we're sort of tracking this by the numbers. But I, I don't know if sort of, as a layperson, I understand what they actually mean. We're seeing spikes in the uh, Sun Belt uh, area, particularly Florida. But many people have argued that, hey, you know what? If you test more, of course you're going to see more cases. And that's really what the situation is. Is that what the situation is, that we're testing more and so we're finding more cases? And, and Maria, I wish we could have a, a more sophisticated, clear common page that we're all on about where the virus is and where our response is, that is shockingly lacking. At Resolve to Save Lives, we work with nearly 100 countries around the world. I was outlining the work that Uganda is doing. I get more information on their website, on their activities, than I get from any state in the United States. And what we need to have is a clear understanding of where the virus is spreading. In terms of the increase, here's one key number to look at in uh, um, combination with other numbers. 
What's the percent of tests that's positive? Nationally, that last week, that increased from 8.1 to 8.7 percent. That may not seem like a big increase, but it's very significant because it tells you in the context of stable or actually increasing test numbers, that this is definitely an increase in spread of the virus. This isn't because of more testing. And you don't have to tell the doctors and nurses who are on the front lines in Phoenix and Texas and Florida, seeing lots and lots of patients with their hospitals and their intensive care units getting fuller and fuller, that this is real. Uh, we have to get past saying, is it the worst thing in the world or is it fake news in some way? The fact is, it's <laughs> nuanced. This is a really bad pandemic, which for a lot of people is very mild. Lots of people don't have any symptoms at all. And at least 99% are going to survive, although some of them will be very ill. But for some people, particularly anyone uh, who's older, people with underlying health conditions, and some younger people who are just for whatever reason, severely attacked by it, this is a deadly pandemic. We've already lost more than 500 healthcare workers' lives, more than 130,000 Americans' lives. And in the coming month, there will be 10, 15,000 more deaths. We will see a lag in deaths following the increase in cases. We expect that. We're doing a little bit better on treating people, uh, but more importantly, it's in the younger age groups currently. That's where the big increase is. But what starts in the young adult population doesn't stay there. It will spread. There will be young mm -hmm. adults who are susceptible to severe illness, older people. And nearly half of all adults in the U.S. have some form of chronic illness that may put them at an increased risk of severe illness. This is not a small fraction of the population that's at risk. It's a lot of us. So there's so much that we need to do together to get control of this virus. Um, I just want to point out to everyone that the good doctor here said 99% of people will survive, which is very different than 99% of the cases are completely harmless, which is what the president said. Just want to point that out. I know you have to go soon, so I want to get in one last question for you, doctor. Um, the uh, U.S. has announced, the U.S. State Department announced that uh, this country will be withdrawing from the uh, World Health Organization. It takes a while. It's not immediate. But um, what are the implications of us pulling out? The implications, frankly, Anne-Marie, are that Americans will be less safe. I worked for five years on loan from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to the World Health Organization. That organization could certainly be stronger. Every organization could. But it is essential. It is necessary to combat this pandemic and others. Pulling out basically leaves us the only country in the world that doesn't have a voice at the leading organization that deals with the epidemics and health emergencies. In fact, I just got off the phone with a call that they convene every week or two with people from all around the world. It's really important. We got very important information from Singapore, from Europe, from uh, Africa, from other parts of the world. This is the kind of collaboration and lesson sharing the World Health Organization has several crucial functions. One of them is information and data so that we can all be on the same page. A second is guidance documents. And frankly, countries all over the world look to WHO for guidance. And the third is support to countries, and they're crucial. We would not have eradicated smallpox from the world if it were not for WHO. If it were not for WHO, Tuberculosis and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis would be a much bigger problem in the U.S. and globally. If it were not for WHO, we would be at much higher risk of influenza pandemics because they coordinate a global network to track that. We need a stronger WHO. The U.S. needs to engage with WHO, insist that it's stronger, and support it to get stronger. Turning our back on the world is just going to undermine our ability to protect America. Uh, Dr. Tom Frieden, thank you so much. Looking forward to hear what else uh, Resolve to Save Lives has to say. I know you are in demand, so we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Nice speaking with you.